So welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for Chapter 10. And in Chapter 10, we are going to be looking at the process of cell division, more specifically, mitosis in eukaryotic cells. Now in Section 10.1, we're going to look at some of the limits to cell growth. As most of us know, cells are really, really small, and there's a reason for that. We're going to talk about that in Section 10.1. We're also going to give you a little bit of information on cell division and why it occurs, and we're going to look at the two different methods of reproduction in organisms. We're going to look at asexual reproduction, and we're also going to briefly look at sexual reproduction. Now, as I had said before, there is a reason why cells are so, so small. And we're going to look at two limits to cell size. In other words, we're going to look at two reasons why cells have to stay really small. One of the first reasons we look at is something called DNA overload. What we need to do is we need to recall that the DNA that's found inside of the nucleus is going to serve as the information center, or what we call the genetic library for the cell. In other words, it basically tells the different parts of the cell what to do. So as the cell grows, the DNA does not. And so what happens is we end up with something called an information crisis. Now here's what I mean by that. If you have a cell that has gotten to a certain size and has basically gone into this information crisis, you might have the nucleus, which is way over here on the left-hand side, and all of these cell parts that are scattered throughout the nucleus have a really hard time getting the information that they need to do what they need to do to keep the cell alive. And plus, we have a lot more of those parts as well. Now, if you can take that cell and you can bring the size down a bit, and you can make that cell just a little bit smaller, again, what you have is you have this nucleus, you have these parts, but it's a lot easier to get that information to the parts so they can do what they need to do. So this is what we mean by DNA overload, and this is what we mean by an information crisis. We need to have a really efficient way to get that information from the nucleus to the cell parts so they can do what they need to do to keep that cell alive. So in addition to DNA overload, we also need to make sure that we understand that if a cell gets too large, it's going to have a really difficult time exchanging materials with the environment. And so that's going to be our second limit to cell size. So as the cell increases in size, it becomes very difficult to get things like food, water, and oxygen to all parts of the cell. And it becomes even more difficult to remove waste from the cell because it has a longer distance to travel. So this rate of exchange is going to depend entirely on two things. It's going to depend on the surface area and the volume of the cell. Now the surface area is going to be everything that you see on the outside of the cell. And the volume, as you learned in math class, is going to be the amount of space that is taken up by the inside of the cell. So looking at both of these items together is going to basically determine how effectively it can exchange material. Now, as we had said before, if you have a cell that's really small, it's a lot easier to get materials on the inside to the different parts of the cell that need it. But as the cell gets larger and that material comes in, it becomes even more difficult for that material to get where it needs to go. And if you have a cell that's really large, then it's even more difficult to get that material in and to be able to move that waste material out of the cell. So exchange of materials is really important to the health of the cell. Now one way to look at this is to introduce a little bit of math and it kind of hits home as to why it's so important for cells to remain relatively small. And So again, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at surface area and we're going to look at the volume of those cells. Now what I have is I have three different types of cells up here. And we're just going to use cubes because the math is a little easier to play with when we use cubes. And so if you notice here, this first cell is going to have a one by one by one set of dimensions. The second one, which is a little bit larger, is going to have a two by two by two. And the third, which is really large, is going to be three by three by three. And so as I had said, we're going to look at the ratio or the comparison between the surface area and the volume. So when we determine surface area, we have to, to use length times width times the number of sides of our cell. And so in this case, as I said, we're going to use a cube. So we're going to multiply that by six sides. So in this first one, we have one times one times six is going to give us six 
centimeters squared, right? So that's going to be the surface area of our first cube. Now the second is going to be 2 times 2 times 6, and so 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 6 is going to be 24 centimeters squared. So that's going to be the surface area of our second cube. And then we have 3 times 3 times 6. So in this case, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 6 is going to be 54 centimeters squared. Now down here on the next one we have volume and to determine volume of our cell or cube we have length times width times height and so in this case we have 1 times 1 times 1 so that's going to be 1 centimeter cubed and in this one we have 2 times 2 times 2 so 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8 so that's going to be 8 centimeters cubed and in this case we have 3 times 3 times 3, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 3 is 27, 27 centimeters cubed. All right. Now we're going to look at the ratio between these two numbers and you can represent ratio in a couple of different ways. You can represent it as a fraction and so in this case we're going to compare surface area to volume. So we have six units of surface area to one unit of volume. So the six came from here, the one came from the volume. Now you can also represent it like this, six units of surface area to one unit of volume. Now over here we have 24 units of surface area to eight units of volume. Now we can reduce that to a three to one ratio. So eight goes into 24 three times. Now again, we can also represent that like this, a three to one. So three units of surface area to one unit of volume. And then over here on the right, we have 54 units of surface area to 27 units of volume. So if we take 27 into 54, we can reduce that down to 2 to 1. So 2 units of surface area to, again, 1 unit of volume. And we can represent that like this as well. So a 2 to 1 ratio. Now what I want you guys to recognize here is that as this cell increased in size, the ratio 6 to 1 for the first one, 3 to 1 for the second, and 2 to 1 for the third, the ratio got smaller and smaller, which means that cell, as it increased in size, became less efficient at the exchange of materials. Now, one of the ways that the cell will actually take care of this is by dividing. And so what you notice over here on the right is we have a very large cell, and when that cell divides and becomes two very small cells, that's going to act to increase the surface area to volume ratio. So let's say, for example, that this large cell, like we had seen on the previous screen, had a ratio of 2 to 1. So we had 2 units of surface area to 1 unit of volume. But once that cell divided, maybe now each of these new cells has a ratio of 6 to 1. 6 units of surface area to 1 unit of volume. So this is going to make the cell much, much more efficient at the exchange of materials. And again, we're talking about things like food, water, oxygen, and definitely the removal of waste from that cell. And each cell is going to get a complete copy of the genetic material or the DNA. So again, when we had talked about DNA overload, we no longer have a situation where we have a certain amount of DNA that has to instruct all the different parts in this large cell on what to do. Now it's a lot easier to get that information to the different parts because the cell is so much smaller. There's not as much distance to travel to get that information to where it needs to go. Now as I had said at the beginning of our screencast, we're also going to briefly look at the differences between asexual and sexual reproduction. So if you're a bacteria or a protozoan, which are single cell creatures, or maybe a very simple multicellular creature, you might perform asexual reproduction. Now what that means is we have a single parent that's going to produce genetically identical offspring. So the offspring that are produced in this type of reproduction are exactly the same as the parent genetically. Now as I had said, there are some multicellular organisms like Hydra that will also perform asexual reproduction because most of the time when you talk about this form of reproduction, we're talking about single cell creatures because again, they're not very complicated and we simply have one cell that's going to divide into two. But if it is a multicellular creature like the Hydra, like you see on the right, that does perform this type of reproduction, it's going to produce something called a bud. And you can see the bud on this Hydra 
right here. So this is going to be the offspring of this hydra. This is going to be the parent or the adult, the single parent, and this is going to be the offspring. Now remember that if it's performing asexual reproduction, this offspring right here is going to be exactly the same as the parent. In other words, genetically they are going to be identical. Now, this is going to allow the organism to reproduce super quickly, so that's going to be one of the advantages to this type of reproduction. You can reproduce pretty fast, but there can be a disadvantage. If environmental conditions should happen to change, because we have all members of the population being genetically identical, there's not a lot of variation in the population. So basically the population or the individuals can't adapt quickly enough and so that can be pretty detrimental to the population. So that can be a drawback to this type of reproduction. But again, if you need to reproduce quickly, it's good to be able to reproduce asexually. Now the second type of reproduction is called sexual reproduction. Now this one is primarily different because instead of just having one individual reproducing as we had looked at in asexual reproduction, we now have two separate parents that are participating in this reproduction. So they are going to contribute what we call reproductive cells. So of course if you're a male you're going to contribute sperm and if you're female you're going to contribute an egg. Now the offspring are going to inherit some characteristics from each parent. Now those characteristics are going to be contained within the sperm and within the egg itself. And so when those two reproductive cells combine, again it's going to be a mix of characteristics between each parent. Now most animals and plants will reproduce in this way. So most multicellular organisms will reproduce using sexual reproduction. Now this is something that will definitely allow genetic diversity. Now what that means is we have lots of different individuals within the population. Now that can be an advantage because again as we had said before if the environment should happen to change we now have some individuals that may be able to actually survive and adapt to that change. Remember when we talked about asexual reproduction if everybody is identical there's no way that adaptation can actually happen because everybody is exactly the same. So in this case sexual reproduction is actually an advantage in this type of situation. So that's going to finish up our first screencast over chapter 10. As always please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.